Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Your Excellency, honored guests, fellow photographers, and friends. Tonight, I'm going to talk about how I got started in Big Cats for Nat Geo. So come along with me into the field with jaguars, snow leopards, cougars, and tigers. They're the apex predators in their ecosystem with no natural predators of their own except us as humans. Apex predators are vitally important to the health of the ecosystem. Just think about our bodies. If we have an organ that doesn't function properly, we don't function properly. And that's the same as ecosystems devoid of predators. Now, a lot of people ask me how I got started with big cats. I didn't take a picture of an animal until I was 34 years old. And I always say, I didn't choose big cats. Big cats chose me. And it was on my first natural history story for National Geographic on the Quetzal. Every day I sat in a plastic chair in the cloud forest in a blind that I made on my own with my lens trained on this nest. Some days I got one picture, maybe two pictures, some day none at all. But as I was walking up the mountain to the one room shack in which I was staying, the hair in the back of my neck would stand up and I'd think something was following me, but there was nothing there. One night, I'm in that one-room shack in my bunk, reading my book like I do every night, when all of a sudden I heard the stairs creaking. Then I heard the floorboards creaking. Then I heard scratching under the door and then sniffing under the door. All the hair on my whole body stood up. I grabbed my trusty machete and whacked it on the side of the bed. Silence. And then for some unknown reason, I whistled. And I heard front paws, back paws going down the stairs. I grabbed the walkie-talkie to call Juan Carlos, my trusty uh, naturalist I was working with. And I told him what had happened. He had the button on the walkie-talkie pushed. All I heard was a bunch of laughing because they were in, in the cantina in the local village, and he said, Steve, don't worry, it's just a black panther. And I was like, Juan Carlos, how come I've been here five weeks and you didn't bother to tell me I was living with a black panther? And he said, we didn't want to worry you, Steve. And I figured that's the night that Big Cats chose me. Now, if anybody would have told me my next story would have been jaguars, I would have said, you're crazy. I don't know anything about Big Cats. But like all stories we do at National Geographic, we start with research. I researched and found out that Nat Geo had never done a story on the Jaguar before. So I kept doing my research and my wife said, don't you figure in 107 years of National Geographic's never done a story on the third largest cat in the world, there's probably a pretty good reason why. And it's because it was too difficult. But I met this man here, the late Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, which I worked on many stories with, and he told me that it would be possible. But I went into the rainforest and tried to stumble around using camera traps, and in three months only got two images. So I was not succeeding, and as failure is not an option if you want to work at National Geographic, I decided I had to find a place where I could see these animals face to face. I got an email from a Brazilian scientist, said, come on down to the Pantanal. So I was in Belize, went to Cancun, and got face to face with a couple of jaguars at Pepe's Swim with Jaguars. It was an animal rehab facility used where he would take in people that had pets as big cats. And I got a picture I didn't know I wanted which was a Jaguar with jet skis in front of Club Med Cancun. So off I went down to the Pantanal. And I had to put my photojournalism hat back on because the Pantanal is 95% privately owned, mostly cattle ranches. And I found out that all these cowboys thought the only good Jaguar was a dead Jaguar. And that every cattle death could be attributed to a jaguar, and as growing up in farm country in Indiana, I thought this was rather ridiculous. So I talked to Alan about funding the first ever 
GPS satellite collar study in the Pantanal so we could teach these ranchers and give them real scientific information. So that there were a few jaguars killing cattle, but we didn't want the main ones to end up like these 12 jaguars killed by one man in 12 months, all supposed cattle killers. When the project was done, they found out only 1% of cattle deaths could be attributed to jaguars, and that gave positive information to the ranchers. Now, while I was down there, I worked with the ranger for Pantanal National Park, Fionn, who taught me how to stick my head in a bucket and call a jaguar. Now, it sounds like this. Now, the first time I ever did this, 10 seconds later, a jaguar called back to me, so I got back in the ranch truck and drove back to the ranch because I didn't know what was going to happen if a jaguar actually came out. But I did get the opener for the first jaguar story for National Geographic. Now, two years later, I did the second story for National Geographic on jaguars, and I got this image. Much more elegant, a young cub climbing up a tree that his mother taught him how to get away from predators on the ground until he was big enough. So that, that was down in the southern part of the Pantanal. And we also worked on a TV program called Jaguars vs. Crocs with Bertie Gregory. And uh, here's a short little clip of what we got. Along the tangled edge of a Brazilian river, a hunter stalks the shadows. He is a jaguar, a male in his prime. Those who know him call him Scarface, from a wound he earned clawing his way to supremacy. the top predator in a land of predators, the best of the best. Pretty incredible, eh? Way to go, Scarface. Now, most of what we saw were just spectacular failures like this, but it would end up with one frame that would be good enough to be a double page in the magazine for the Jaguar story, which was great. Now, one of the most important things that happened on the first story was there was two pictures published from the Pantanal. And because of that, tourists started coming because it's the only place in the world where you could see jaguars. Because of this, uh, that helped save the jaguar because a paper was just written that showed each cow is worth $2,000 in its lifetime. But every jaguar brings in $108,000 every year in ecotourism income. So none of the locals are going to touch a hair on any of these cats' head, which means it's an oasis for jaguars, which is great. And I got a picture I waited 20 years to get, which was a mom and cub jaguars, which made me very happy. Now. Uh, there is something that's going on for the first time since the 70s. This is the medicinal market in Quito and Peru, Iquitos. And there's a jaguar skin right there. And I went and met some of the, of the indigenous tribes outside of Iquitos on the Amazon and talked to the head of the tribe. And he said that they're hunting jaguar 12 months out of the year because every October, someone from a Chinese corporation comes to buy the four canines and now bones. So jaguars are in trouble again, unfortunately. Now, I got an email in 1999 from my editor who's sitting right here. And a bunch of us did and said, what would your dream assignment be? And after that first jaguar story, I thought, well, I just did a story on a cat I 
hardly ever saw. Why don't I do a story on a cat I'll never see? So I wrote, I'll do the snow leopard. <laughs> now, the first thing we need to do as wildlife photographers is find scientists or local people that can help us. I went to Chitral in Pakistan and Hemis in India. But Chitral got 10 feet of snow, over three meters of snow. So I went to Hemis. <laughs> I myself brought 33 bags with me of equipment, sleeping bags, warm clothes. I mean, you think of what you need. So, you know, we flew from Delhi and then Delhi up to Leh, the capital of Ladakh. This is where we're gonna start our uh, snow leopard expedition. We'll be here a few days to acclimate to the altitudes at 12,000 feet. And then got the bags into where the road ends by uh, truck and jeep. And then we had to load everything on horseback and walk in. We took in 14 remote cameras and a whole camp. Tents, sleeping bags, cots, pads. We bought food from the US and then we bought some in India. At night it was 30 below zero. And I've spent my whole career working in jungles. So this was a real <laughs> switch for me. We looked for locations with the help of the local people that worked with the Snow Leopard NGOs. They had already ID'd locations where the cat comes to mark. This is a new uh, track for Snow Leopards. It looks, you know, the, this is female one. This is uh, last uh, two days, you know, very fresh step and tracks. You can see someone, you know, uh, uh, spraying here. With this knowledge, we were able to find locations to set up cameras where we knew that cats would come to visit. Once we knew we were having success in like a specific trail, hold it. then I would, I quote, mine that trail with remote cameras. Okay, let's put the caps on, get the rope up, we're done. Well, the first day we were there, we put up a camera trap and we came back to camp, and all of a sudden the cook starts screaming in Ladakhi, and I said, Tashi, what's he saying? He said, there's a snow leopard on the ridge. So on the first day we saw a snow leopard, 36 hours we saw two more, and then for the next six months I never saw another cat. But when you're doing camera traps, you don't really need to. I had to figure out how to take these beautiful landscapes and then take that infrared beam, which is the white string is, and put the cat where I wanted it in my composition so that first frame was mine. But everybody here, at the end of the day, you look at the back of your camera or your phone and see what you took that day. The only thing I would see is Tashi or nothing. I started calling this Zen and the art of camera trapping and found that you have to have a lot of patience and faith that you put the cameras in the right place and that Tashi would eventually turn into a snow leopard. And this is how camera traps work. You find a trail to put the receiver on that you know the cat's going to walk on, connect the camera, flashes, the cat breaks the beam in your composition, and off it goes and you get a picture. And we started getting images within the first three days. But one of the guys on the team said, you'll never get a picture of a cat here during the day. And whenever a human tells me what an animal's going to do, I figure they're going to do the exact opposite. So I reframed this and it turned into a double page in the story that was this, a male marking his territory. But we had to find a place to put up the rest of these 13 cameras. And we were here, the snow started, but I got it framed up and then I got a picture of a bunny. They said it was a Tibetan bunny, but we need a snow leopard. So two and a half weeks later, I had a huge weight lifted off my shoulders when I got this image. So we knew it was working. And here is a male marking his territory to tell other males this is my home, not yours, and that's a way that they can communicate to each other. 
Now, Buddhism is the glue that holds these communities together. And as we were walking around, I would see pieces of paper with a picture of the Dalai Lama on it and some Sanskrit. So I said, Tashi, what is that? And he says, it says, follow the Buddhist tenets of respect for all life and don't kill snow leopards. So we went up to see some herders because their livestock is vitally important to them. Local people need to benefit from living with predators. So I started working with a local NGO that were making predator-proof corrals. And I asked this older man what he thought of his new corral. He said it's the best night's sleep he's had since he was a young kid because he didn't have to worry about losing his livestock. And then I found that most of these villagers were losing 30% of their livestock to disease. And I had brought up a bunch of vaccine from USAID in Delhi. I hired the vet on the right, and we started a program that we would run for three years, and then the community takes over. That's like putting 30% more money in their pocket every year, as long as they promise not to kill snow leopards. And look, it took four and a half months, but Tashi turned into a snow leopard. And then I got this image, which was a snow leopard in a snowstorm, and I was awarded uh, because my wife entered for me, BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year. <laughs> now, a f oh, thank you very much. Now, a friend of mine, Dr. Hodder Howard Quigley, said, Steve, how come you've never worked in the United States in over 20 years? And I said, Howard, no reason, but why? And he said, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is rapidly being rewilded and the natural history of mountain lions is changing with the reintroduction of wolves and grizzly bears. So I wrote a proposal, gave it to Kathy, it got approved, and, and off we went. Because I found it so fascinating that a natural history of an animal in this day and age is changing. It's not changing, it's going back to the way it always was. But a lot of people ask, how do you put a GPS sack collar on a big cat? Well, with cougars, they chase him up a tree, and here there's a graduate student, and she just darted that male in the Black Hills of South Dakota. You can see he's not very happy about that. And then they lower him to the ground and do a complete medical workup on the cat, which is vitally important. Because right about this time, my assistant saw seven mountain lions together and told this group, called it, got a cell phone signal and said, I'm looking at seven mountain lions together. They called him a liar. He said, here's the GPS points, come out and see for yourself. And they found that it was true. Mountain lions were priding up like uh, lions in Africa because wolves were threatening them and their cubs. It's always been that way, but nobody wrote it down 130 years ago. And in many Western states, big game hunting of cougars and mountain lions is still legal. And I, luckily, I was able to get this image of a mom and her kitten. Now, one of the most important parts of this story to me was the fact that as our cities are getting larger, we're looking for homes in the homes of animals. So a lot of urban areas were starting to see big cats and other types of wildlife. And there had been some scat above the Golden Gate Bridge, so I put cameras there but didn't get anything except this bobcat. So I had heard from Howard Quigley, the scientist that I mentioned before, that they had cats that were collared right north of LA. And he had a cat that walked through Cher's backyard. So I went to a mountain lion meeting in Bozeman, Montana to ask Jeff, whether he had any cats that walked on trails where you could see the lights of L.A. And he said, no. And I was kind of depressed. And so I said, well, wouldn't it be great to tell the story of urban wildlife if uh, we could get a mountain lion with the Hollywood sign? Now, he looked at me like I was crazy because scientists believe in what is, not what could be. But I gave him my card. Eight months later, I got a text saying, call me now and write where that cross is, they got a picture of a mountain lion in Griffith Park. And then my job starts, how do you put camera traps in downtown LA without them getting stolen? So I put them up and I got a picture of a bobcat. 
but a bobcat with the lights of L.A. Then I got a picture of a deer. Then I got a picture of a raccoon. Then I got a picture of a guy walking his dog. Then I got a picture of a guy going, what's that? And then I got an image of people doing a selfie they'll never see because it's my camera. And then after 11 months, I got that first idea of the now named P-22 with the lights of L.A. in the background. Now things really changed because the 125th anniversary of National Geographic was going on and we had a show there. And they wanted a picture to put on in the L.A. Times. So what picture did they put in the L.A. Times one Saturday? You can imagine with 24 million visitors in Griffith Park every year what people thought of the fact that there was a mountain lion there now. So Jeff the scientist went on every local TV station and calmed people down and said this is an elusive cat and it won't cause any problems. And to this day only six confirmed sightings have been of this cat. But it got a groundswell of support in the greater LA area for a wildlife which is great. And then TV asked me, you think you can give video of this cat? So light camera action. There is P-22 walking on a trail with Santa Monica in the background. He's looking around because he's never seen white light before because the Hollywood sign hasn't been lit since the early 1930s when it said Hollywood land. And then it just pays to think big and be a little crazy because after 15 months, there you go. <laughs> I got the picture of the mountain lion under the Hollywood sign. For all the photographers out there, it's a four second exposure, the flash went off, the cat kept walking, and then the Hollywood sign was exposed. But I can't tell you the amount of support that LA gave this cat and all the wildlife around there. Because of it, people started investigating, found out the Santa Monica National Recreation Area where this cat came from is like a virtual prison. These cats cannot get out of here. And so now, because of this image and the power of photography, they are now going to build the largest wildlife overpass in the world across the 101 freeway and save mountain lions. So that's great. Thank you. Leopards. Now, I decided to do a leopard story, and I'm always looking for different ways to do it, and I love this image of the Milky Way behind the leopard. She's sitting in the tree waiting for a moment to jump down when the hyenas kind of open up, and just using a little bit of light just to light the leopard and nothing else. And there's a leopard in the dry grass that shows its camouflage. But we're always looking for something that makes a difference. I was invited to Shembe, the Zulu religion, where all the males wear leopard skins. And I was invited by, I, his name escapes me right now, Dickerson. And uh, he was working for a panther who came up with an idea to make fake skin for these men. Because there's thousands upon thousands of Zulu elders that wear leopard skins. Now there's 18 and a half thousand fake skins. That's 18 and a half thousand leopards that weren't killed, I mean, in one way, shape, or form. And so throughout Africa, this is happening where instead of using leopards, they're using fake skins, which they like better, and there will be leopards for the future, which is fantastic. Now, yay to Furs for Life. That's the name of the project. Now, because of the Hollywood Cougar, I'm always looking for something different in urban areas also. And I found out there's about 50 leopards living inside a park in the center of Mumbai. So I went there to try to get images of this for a magazine story for National Geographic magazine and for another TV show for Nat Geo Wild.
And you can see a female here. This is an Islamic holy site. The Iman has a little water hole for his chickens and goats. And at night he puts them inside and the leopards come to drink. One night it's the mom at dawn. The next night it's two of her cubs coming. So this is incredible. And here's a short video about what the people think about living with leopards. Around here, people have gotten used to the leopards, and many even seem excited about their presence. Okay, you see the bamboos? Right. Okay. I just pointed some light from here, and was sitting over there. Oh, it was. Us. It was watching us. How do you feel about living with leopards? It's too cool. Yeah. <laughs> During nighttime, I, of course, my windows are open. Right. And from here, you can see that it very clearly I can make out. Yeah. The leopard passing through. Never in my lifetime I had seen that. I was very excited, very thrilled. You wow. just happened to be up and looked yeah, out the window? Oh, window. that's amazing. <laughs> How many places in the world could you do that? That's why it's so unique. You live here, leopards live there. That's great. And they are our neighbors. Yeah, they're, they're your neighbors. And I was able to get this, which was the opener of the story. During the day, the people use the park. At night, the leopards use the park. You can see how close this leopard is with a wide angle lens to this apartment building. And the people I just interviewed live in that bottom right hand window there. So to me, that's incredible. But there are problems because, unfortunately, the Department of Forestry bar brought leopards in from outside and relocated them there. I'm standing on the place where an 11-year-old girl was killed, and unfortunately, this mother lost her 5-year-old daughter. But because of the television program and the magazine article, the laws have been changed in India. No more relocation. And the laws are protecting both humans and leopards in this area, so that is great. And here is one of, if not my favorite picture, because I love the fact that in this city, there's a lone leopard walking across the bridge the British built 150 years ago, like he doesn't have a care in the world. Now, I have been extremely lucky in my career to be able to work with the largest cat in the world, the most endangered cat in the world, the tiger. A hundred years ago, there were 100,000 tigers in about 31 countries. Now there's about 4,000. So tigers are under threat. I went to Kaziranga National Park to get Smiling Tiger here. Kaziranga was founded in 1905 to protect the Indian one-horned rhino. Kaziranga is also a historic landscape for the tiger where they live with the largest population left of Asian elephants and the highest density of tigers found anywhere in the world. But it, Kaziranga is surrounded by tea gardens and local farms also. But rhinos are, uh, rhinos are in danger because their horn is worth more than its weight in gold. But it's made of keratin, the same thing as our hair and our fingernails. So I always say, Chew your fingernails and save a, tiger, save a rhino. But Kaziranga is under threat from poachers with AK-47s, but the guards are crack shots, and most of the poachers end up either killed or captured. Tiger poaching really... Uh, poachers started targeting tigers in the 1980s when an appetite for traditional Chinese medicine skyrocketed with the rising Chinese middle class. Because throughout millennia, all parts of tigers have been used. But for the past 45 years, they've been off the medicinal list because they have no medicinal value. But now the, it has changed. The poaching has changed from health to wealth. The wealthy in China are using tiger products as status symbols like tiger skin furniture and tiger bone wine, which is used by soaking a tiger skeleton for months in rice wine, taking the bottles now and putting them in bank vaults. They're banking on extinction. But there is hope, and hope looks like Jackie Chan. 
because throughout China with IFA and Wild Aid, there's public service announcements to try to uh, influence young people through social media, public service announcements, the internet. They want to go to the pharmacy. They don't want to ingest endangered species and to get them to influence their parents and grandparents not to use these products. And here's one of these PSAs. When the buying stops, the killing can too. To think outside the box in an economic way and to stop the demand for these products. We just need more PSAs to help save tigers. But that man, the movie stars, the sports stars, the politicians that are involved are the true heroes. That's Yao Ming used to play for the NBA in the United States. So there is hope and that is great. But there's still revenge killings like here, this elephant that was shot in a rice paddy. And for some reason, rhinos don't like it. I was charged numerous times and had to buy three doors for the Jeeps as they smashed into them. But one of the things which other people have talked about is gaining the trust of the people you work with. I need the trust of the director of these parks because I want to put camera traps in dangerous areas. So he saw this picture and let me put camera traps up for Smiling Tiger who's looking around going, where's that light coming from? And National Geographic gives us the time in the field for synchronicity to happen. So when I see a tiger hunting elephant babies, that in the end I can get a picture of why tiger has stripes and the camouflage of a tiger because I'm given the opportunity to be there for a long time. Now on the last tiger story, I was told by scientists that the next tiger to go extinct would be the Sumatran tiger. So I wanted to cover the Sumatran tiger also because much of Sumatra looks like this, but much of it looks like this because of this, palm oil. In the future, you'll be able to buy products that say uh, sustainable palm oil, but it's too corrupt right now for that to happen. But in the future, it will. And people come from Java to plant palm oil. They set up snares to feed their family just like we would, but snares are indiscriminate, indiscriminate, and they catch too many young tiger cubs like this one that spent four days in a snare and had his right front leg amputated. But because of that last picture in Nat Geo, we got snares outlawed in Sumatra. So that was fantastic. And this is a tiger that was poached out of a zoo that she had lived in for 16 years. And a great project they started there that works so well in Africa is hiring poachers, giving them a job, because who better to find a poacher than an ex-poacher, one that's happy because they're getting a paycheck. So that's good. And there is a picture of a wild Sumatran tiger, one not in a zoo. I wanted to go to Thailand because this is very important. There's only one population left of the Indo-Chinese tiger, and it's in the Western Forest Complex up by the Burma border. These guys have been working for 25 years. They're doing the first ever home range study of female tigers. We're just learning their biology as they go extinct. And I'd heard about this place called the Thai Tiger Temple. Now, the scientists said, Steve, don't go there. They're a bad place involved in the black market trade. And I said, well, how many tigers do they have? They said, well, they say, oh, you say they have 150, but you can bottle feed and pet cubs 365 days a year. I said, well, then I'm going because there's something fishy going on. So I went there. You can get tiger cub selfies and got a picture for the magazine that ran but a couple years later, my wife started working, who, my wife who's a, a Woodrow Wilson fellow, a Nat Geo explorer and writer, 
uh, she started working with a small NGO in Australia that had the undercover information that we needed to get to the proper authorities. We went back, she wrote stories, I did the video, and here's a short segment from the video. This is all being done at night, pitch black, there are no lights. You see the cars driving into the Tiger Temple and the staff workers that are helping the wildlife traders. <laughs> In December 2014, at the famed Tiger Temple in Thailand, investigators say a group of animal traffickers botched their late-night tiger heist. Our sources tell us they were supposed to take unregistered tigers like they had before. But instead, investigators believe they took these three tigers, tigers with names and a paper trail. A year later, National Geographic traveled there to investigate what happened that night. The temple presents itself as a sanctuary where monks live in harmony with 147 tigers. It's also a popular tourist destination that brings in an estimated $3 million a year. For years, conservationists and the media have reported abuse and exploitation of these animals. But we obtained exclusive evidence from the conservation group Sea for Life, which they say shows that this Buddhist monastery is trafficking tigers into the illegal international wildlife trade, meaning that the tiger you took a selfie with one day could end up dead and smuggled across the border the next. I have the evidence to show the world why we have CCTV, Charlie has been a long-term advisor to the temple. We're not showing his face to protect his identity. Unfortunately, there were tigers that were, for lack of a better term, wolves. They're dead. They were killed. It was an inside job, unfortunately. In February 2015, the Tiger Temple's veterinarian presented evidence to the authorities that he says shows that the three tigers had disappeared in December. He handed over the microchips that had been cut out of the tiger. With that evidence in hand, officials from the Department of National Parks went to the temple in 2015 and confirmed that the three tigers were indeed gone. National Geographic gathered additional evidence, suggesting that tigers have been disappearing for at least a decade. Basically, I was doing my rounds and then found that there was cubs for in a couple of the cages with the female tigers, obviously. And then the next morning, they say, no, there's no tigers. And I say, well, I saw the tigers with my own eyes. I saw them being born. Um, so what's that all about? They quietly said to me that they're going to a tiger farm in Laos. Despite allegations of trafficking for many years, no one has ever been accused or prosecuted. Now, with new evidence from Sea for Life, the Federal Royal Thai Police says it will soon begin an in-depth investigation into alleged wildlife trafficking and possible money laundering. I want the people in the world to know this place is illegal. The tiger is like the rare animal now. Tiger, they cannot do anything if we don't help them. It's not for them. Sharon wrote the first article in January, and then all the Thai media started picking it up, which we wanted. They took the video off the Nat Geo site, my pictures off Nat Geo Instagram, which is great to get the word out to the government. And then she wrote three more articles on the 4th in June. The government went in removed all the tigers, found 40 tigers on meat hooks in the freezer, and 20 cubs in jars, and they took all the tigers out, and the tiger temple is now closed, which is fantastic. Thank you. And thanks to Sharon for all of her hard work. She did it. I went back to India just very quickly. The first thing I do when I go to a park is ask the guards on the ground, where would you put a camera trap if you were going to? So I can be out shooting while it's working. And here's some images from the waterhole camera trap that I put together in this animation. Uh, you, you can see the one in back I called Smasher because he would just smash my cameras till they quit working and then I had to go fix them again. 
So uh, I spent a lot of my time with the anti-poaching patrol. It's too dangerous to walk. These are old logging elephants that they use, or else I'm in a Jeep. I had to go back to get a, the iconic picture we need for every Nat Geo big cat story. And one day turned into two days. One week turned into two weeks. On the 24th day, I saw a cub nursing there. I put my eye up to the camera with a 600 millimeter on it, took a few frames, looked up, the cub was gone. I asked the mahout, did the cub come out? He said yes. I took the card out of the camera, stuck it in my pocket. Two and a half hours later, I downloaded the picture and sat there and cried like a baby because that is what I got. Mom and Cub, which is also the cover of the National Geographic Tigers Forever book. Now, the good news is big cats are very adaptable. They need just the basics, food, water, and a secure place to live. Females can breed at the age of three and have 15 cubs in their lifetime. When you have protection, strong laws, enforcement, and careful monitoring, big cats will bounce back. But many people ask me, why save big cats? I believe we should save big cats because of living beings, they have a right to walk the face of the earth. But I think there's a much larger reason. By saving big cats, we can also help save ourselves. Because by preserving the big tracts of land big cats need, um, we can give them a place to hunt, to find a mate, and land for the young to disperse. But the forests are the lungs of the world, pulling carbon from the atmosphere and slowing, carbon, slowing climate change. And every, as you look at the world here, all those forests have cats in them. The puma goes from the Yukon to Patagonia, the jaguar from the U.S.-Mexican border to northern Argentina. As we go around, we have the Sumatran the Siberian tiger, Sumatran tiger, Amur leopard, Asiatic leopard, all the different tiger species, and then we make it around to Africa where we have cheetahs, leopards, and lions. All this land is populated by cats. Nature is perfection. We need to save it. If we can save big cats, we can help save ourselves. I hope these stories and images help to inspire you because where there's life, there's hope, but the time to act is now. Thank you all very much.